Hello and welcome to The Punch. I'm David Penberthy and joining me again on the panel this week are Punch Deputy Editor Tori Maguire and Punch Columnist Luke McElveen. Um, I might start with you if I can, uh, Tors. Sure. Um, we saw uh, yesterday um, four economists uh, uh, quoted in The Australian saying that um, it doesn't look like the, uh, the, the recession is going to be as deep as was um, initially feared and we've seen calls from Joe Hockey uh, the, the shadow treasurer for the, uh, the government to look at delaying um, some $40 billion, uh, in, uh, in, in the, the stimulus money, particularly for schools and so forth. Um, what's your take on that? Do you think that the government should, should look at, um, at, at, at winding it back, perhaps, for, for fear of overheating the economy? Well, David, one of those economists in the Oz yesterday was Chris Richardson, and he said, I think, um, that perhaps the stimulus effect could have been achieved by putting um, more pressure, downward pressure on interest rates than by boosting um, government debt and government spending. And that perhaps that could have had the same impact on keeping us out of a technical recession without leaving future generations in an enormous world of pain on the debt front. And I think considering that the Reserve Bank last, just last week said that we're looking at probably two percentage points in interest rate rises um, starting before Christmas, mm. perhaps that is an argument for winding back some of the Ford Estimates stimulus spending mm. because, you know, if, if they're sh shelling out money and then the Reserve Bank is kind of clawing it back, that's just going to end up in some weird kind of cycle. Mm. And look, the government has acknowledged that the stimulus spending was about getting money out there quickly. Mm. So yeah. why they've got it sort of spread out over the next three or four years um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, sure. Um, Anthony Albanese in Canberra, are you with us again now, mate? I am indeed, David. OK, look, I don't know if you could hear what we were uh, just saying at the start there, um, Minister, but this emerging debate about whether the economy is now at risk of being overstimulated, for the past couple of weeks, couple of months, you've been the man in the hard hat uh, doling out the, the cash for these shovel-ready projects. Do you now fear, as Minister, that perhaps if you continue at this rate, uh, there is a danger that the economy may overheat and interest rates could go up. No, not at all, David. We had uh, three parts to the stimulus package. The first was uh, a cash stimulus, which uh, immediately provided that boost for retail spending, and uh, the success was there. I think if you compare our December quarter uh, retail spending, for example, over the rest of the world, and uh, the fact that Australia is uh, one of the, uh, the, well, the only advanced industrialised country not to experience negative growth. We indeed have the highest growth, the second uh, lowest level of unemployment. We also have the lowest debt and the lowest deficit of uh, the industrialised world. But the first step was that immediate stimulus. The second was um, medium infrastructure, medium term infrastructure. And the third is longer term infrastructure. We need to invest in that infrastructure spending so that we come out of the impact of the global economic recession uh, as a more productive economy. It's about uh, investing in future prosperity, which is why it's so surprising that uh, our opponents have been a bit all over the shop. Uh, they've said that we haven't done enough, we've done too much. Uh, the only thing that they're consistent about is, uh, is that they're always critical and they're constantly uh, talking the Australian economy down. But have you been happy with the way in which all of this money has been allocated, though? I mean, it, it seems that every other day there's another story um, about schools which don't actually need any major financial leg up at all suddenly getting a big bucket of cash. Yet we've also seen that some schools in, in battling suburbs have missed out on uh, much needed money for um, small scale infrastructure projects. Has it, has it been targeted as well as it could have been? Look, when you look at the, uh, the details, I uh, was acting education minister for a little while in the House. And uh, one of the examples that was raised uh, there was a school in uh, the Port Stephens area that uh, there was a, a report that said um, that uh, money had been wasted 
that uh, one uh, quote from got by the local school was for yeah, around about, uh, these aren't the figures, but around about $100,000 and the, uh, the Department of Education had said $200,000. So on the surface that looked to be uh, a not a wise use of taxpayers' money. When you looked at the detail, uh, the first quote had no hookup to electricity to water, uh, it had uh, no uh, appropriate facilities, no air conditioning, no, uh, it wasn't safe in terms of the, uh, the design of it. And uh, when you looked at it with all the details that were in the second quote, then it would have been, uh, it would have been even more costly to go down the road of the quote that the local PNC had got. You, you'll inevitably have uh, some issues and when those issues have been raised, uh, the minister, Julia Gillard, has, uh, has dealt with them. I mean, we've got some 3,300 local community infrastructure projects as part of the regional and local community infrastructure program. Uh, they're being rolled out. Uh, there, there isn't any serious criticism of, uh, of any of those projects. That's quite remarkable. Mm. Um, one of the things that we've done there is by going through local government, it's uh, the local councils determining their priorities rather than uh, me sitting here in, in Canberra determining that. Um, we've had uh, from the December stimulus package, we put $1.2 billion into, into rail infrastructure. Um, last, uh, a fortnight ago, I was down at Seymour in Victoria actually opening the line. We'd had uh, some 227,000 concrete sleepers uh, laid that had created jobs there, 120 jobs in, in regional Victoria, an additional 60 jobs making the concrete sleepers at a factory in Wagga Wagga, and all completed. Uh, so from announcement through to completion, just a period of months. But, now, but that, that sort of activity, activity has been uh, has been what has uh, ensured that we're in a much stronger position than uh, the other industrialised countries, be they in the United States, North America or our regional Europe. That's all well and good though, Minister, but isn't there a danger that there could be this emerging perception among some voters that some of this spending has been a little bit profligate and, you know, when you've got the, the Governor of the Reserve Bank saying that um, over, over the, the, the next uh, you know, short, short term, rates could go up by as much as 2%, that you guys could, going into an election, politically end up owning some kind of responsibility for the fact that you've splurged so much money and made rates go up again? Well, we've got the balance right, I think, and we will, uh, of course, uh, have responsibility uh, for uh, for the, the the state of the economy, but I think we've gotten uh, credit. The, the Australian public are a bit smarter than uh, Malcolm Turnbull gives them uh, credit for, okay. and uh, they know, for example, the idea that uh, you know Australia somehow the Rudd government created the global economic recession. Uh, it wasn't of our making. It began in the United States. We we had a problem to deal with. And I think we got, uh, we got ahead of the, the game. We didn't just sit back and watch the impact. Uh, we got out there. We had that initial uh, stimulus uh, of, uh, of, of cash payments uh, to stimulate retail. But we had 70% uh, of the stimulus package is on infrastructure. And that will have long-term benefit. That's about investing as well. When you invest in uh, infrastructure such as our rail infrastructure, mm. That's going to make uh, the economy far more productive uh, just, in the uh, future. I might just cross back quickly to Luke in the studio here. Um, Luke, you're the Chief of Staff for the Daily Telegraph, the biggest selling paper in uh, New South Wales. What do you think the sort of suburban take on the stimulus spending is? I mean, the readers of the Telegraph are very focused on you know, sound economic management um, at the federal level, um, do, you, do you think that they felt that something had to be done and they're giving the government credit for it, or are they a bit sus about how far it's gone? I think the first reaction was something had to be done, that, that the economy was in a world of trouble. We saw what was coming out of the United States. People were genuinely worried for their, for their homes. 
uh, they needed uh, some assurance that, um, that a stimulus was on the way. I think in the aftermath, though, people are starting to ask, has this bucket of money been used in the best way possible? And I can think of two examples that are being hotly debated, um, uh, both in the Telegraph and on radio this morning. Uh, and that is the area of, uh, of education spending. We had the story last week, Claymore Public School, one of the poorest suburbs in Sydney. Uh, that public school was left off the list of maintenance projects. It couldn't get a look in for any of that uh, $2 billion um, uh, school maintenance stimulus funding, uh, which is a massive oversight when you've got, um, you've got uh, schools in the eastern suburbs getting money to build a, build a school hall or a gymnasium. The other one is this, uh, this issue of, um, of insulation. Uh, which was to be drawn from the $4 billion pool. I mean, that's a lot of Bradford bats. Uh, that's, a lot, that's a lot of money for a job that, um, uh, that anybody prepared to climb up into the roof could probably do themselves. And there's a lot of concerns now that that money is being um, taken advantage of by, you know, by less, than, uh, uh, less than ethical operators who are calling themselves suddenly home insulators. So I think there's some, there is some scepticism now on how the money has been administered. Uh, but I think, you know, generally, um, uh, I, I don't think you can fault the government for putting the money in there and, uh, and shortening what looks like a, what was going to be a, a much more uh, dire economic situation. I'll, I'll ask you too, Tory. Um, what we were saying before about the, the performance of the Liberal Party in, uh, in, in question time this week, a lot of their um, criticisms of the government went to a bit of a fishing expedition about what was going to be either ruled in or out of the Henry tax review. Um, how much traction do you think that they're going to be able to get with tactics like that? Look, uh, it's interesting at the moment, all the semantics seem to be turned on their head because Malcolm Turnbull's being called an irresponsible economic manager because he's opposed to massive spending. And I think maybe the government, what they need to do right now is stop calling this stimulus and just start calling it education spending and infrastructure spending and then they'll stop being attacked about it being stimulus money. But the tax review stuff, the idea that the state governments should be encouraged to levy their own um, income tax, I think would absolutely terrify people. Mm. Can, I, can I cross back to you in, uh, in Canberra, um, Minister? Um, there, there were reports this morning that, um, that one of the things Ken Henry is indeed looking at in his tax review is, is giving states that very power to levy some kind of income tax. How would, how would you guys federally go about selling that as being a particularly good idea? Well, look, we, we have a, uh, a tax review. It's being undertaken by a committee chaired by Ken Henry. Uh, it's been uh, given terms of reference uh, at the first half of last year. And we've heard uh, not that much about it uh, in the meantime. It has been doing its work for, for over a year now. What we have is the, the, uh, the opposition coming into parliament uh, asking uh, the sort of are you still still beating your wife type questions, um, you know? Do you agree with this? Uh, do you agree with this uh, particular tax? Will you rule it in? Will you rule it out? Um, it really is absurd. Let's get let the Henry review uh, get on with its job. It will make recommendations, and uh, the government uh, will then make uh, decisions. Well, the government. Uh, but this is a. Will the this government is be about making, a, a, an open review. Will the government be doing what the Howard government did ahead of the 1998 election of being totally candid and saying, as, as Howard did with the GST, OK, these are the proposals, these are the ones we agree, agree with and we're going to give you the chance to vote for them at the next election? Well, look, I think the idea that uh, somehow uh, the federal government, uh, which uh, I remind you, of course, uh, has difficulty getting uh, issues that we have a mandate from the last election, uh, such as the, uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme through the Senate, the idea that somehow we can slip in a change that includes uh, state taxation of, of incomes is, I think, pretty far-fetched. <laughs> and uh, you would know that. I think people might we notice. We might pick up on it, you think? I, I, I think so. I think the punch would, uh, <laughs> would uh, go through the Richter scale in terms of its uh, input from, uh, from the community. Maybe, some, maybe the, the writers on the punch, if they missed it, I'm sure some of the readers who make a contribution would pick it no, up. I think you'd probably get busted for that, Minister. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back with more on the punch after this. 